I'm, I'm delighted to be here, and thank you, Jane and Nea, for organizing this. Uh, one of the nice things about an event like this, uh, and I've, as a graduate student, I've done events like this, is uh, it's vibrant cross-disciplinary uh, mixes, which is really very nice, uh, which is something I've always, always enjoyed. But the difficult task for me, because the, you know, the plenary speaker is a heavy word, it usually means an older person, 60s, 70s, assumed to map out the terrain. I'm not very good at that. What I'm going to do is do something else. Uh, be, do what we try and do in Sarai, try and set out a few provocations. And I'm going to share with you uh, an essay that is going to be published in a book uh, on urban dystopia from Princeton University Press that should be out either in December this year or in January. It was a very interesting conference. I've never actually spoken on this before, except there. So I'll share this with you. Most of it is from that essay. And this is largely taking material from Delhi, but it looks at larger issues, I think, in, in urban studies. In his essay in uh, Sarai Reader 2, Cities of Everyday Life, Gyan Prakash announced uh, in, in a widely circulated essay that the nationalist indifference to urban life in the post-colonial period was clearly over and India's urban turn had arrived. Though the essay did not say very much what the urban turn was, clearly it was a signature of transition. Something had changed. How are we to understand this urban turn in South Asia, if not the rest of the post-colonial world? In the coming decades, the vast majority, the vast majority of the world's largest cities will be in the post-colonial world outside the West. It will be clearly the transition to another era. You have the large urban archive of Western modernity, central to the rise of the subject, Western individualism, incarnated in the city, beginning from Weber to Marx, something is going to change. One way for me to look at this is not to explain what the urban turn is, but try and examine what it does and the ways in which it works out what it does. And I'm going to take one problematic that this shift is raising, that is the idea of urban crisis, which is very prominent in South Asia and many post-colonial cities all over the world. In recent years, a genre has emerged which seeks to explain the turbulent expansion of cities in the South. This genre is called urban crisis writing. The most recent incarnation is Mike Davis's Planet of Slums, which reads the urban crisis in the post-colonial world as her heralding a new apocalyptic slumming of the world cities. In Davis's narrative, a fetid, violent urbanism in the periphery is the future of modern capitalism. With collapsing cities and open sewage, vast migratory populations, and the retreat of secular and state forms. To Davis's discomfort, welfare and self-help are now provided not by the state or by radicals, which he would like, but by religious movements of popular Islam and Christianity. Davis's work recalls Victorian reformers' deployment of shock expose and horror to focus on congestion, disease and poverty in mid-19th century cities. In the post-colonial world, including the city I live in, a version of the planet of slums has also crowded urban discourse in, in the past decade. This is the classic landscape of planners and older reform elites. This discourse fills op-ed columns, widely publicized releases of status reports on the city, including one we saw uh, that, that Jane talked about, and media campaigns. For social liberalism and the inheritors of 20th century progressive urbanism, post-colonial urban catastrophe are signatures of weakened sovereignties, the rise of neoliberal global ur urban expertise and private developers, and the failing dreams of a more equal way of life as imagined by planners. So there's a whole new old liberal grouping that which sees their world coming apart. Others have taken an entirely different path. When flying over Lagos 
In a helicopter a few years ago as part of his research project, Rem Kula suddenly realized that the city that seemed on the ground like a smoldering, burning rubbish dump was in fact a stunning post-plan metropolis. Kula saw vast complementary coherences among the apparent chaos of Lagos. A self-organized rhythm of urban life, markets, traffic interfaces, network innovations that all rendered its very dysfunctionality productive. When the post-independence order fell away, suddenly, for Kulas, in the vast interstices of the planned city, a new rhythm emerged. Without mega-designs, first parasitic, then productive and dynamic, or perhaps all of them together. Kulas' text has the merit of cutting through the apocalyptic critics of urbanism. In his explanation, the dramaturgy of Lagos is filled with possibilities that speak beyond the classic narratives of survival and loss. As a dramaturgy that evokes a different possibility of urban life to Western readers, to whom Kulas's text is aimed at, I think Kulas's mediation fails on one count. The productive city of the South seems to have enveloped the dead into the ever-flowing, ever-living. If Mike Davis's doomsday narrative is aimed at shocking Western policymakers and readers with his catalog of third-world shantytown horrors, Kulas's text flows maybe unintentionally, with the current vitalist moment in social theory. Kulas' no narrative is like is a chapter of a novella to be written, the middle reel of a movie that has no ending. The lecture on Leg Lagos may work as an abstract lesson for Western architecture, but fails to capture the emerging urban media techniques, which are simultaneously productive and phobic, dynamic, adaptive, and equally violent. Crisis in cities offers, I think, a transformation of discourse since the mid-19th century. There's a reassemblage of arguments, a new arrangement of elites, a mutation of power in the city. This is the history of most cities when there's an urban crisis. New archives of memory are released, new insights are gained. And crisis has been prominent in urban debates all over India, in Bombay, in Calcutta, in Delhi, with middle-class mobilizations, media events, interventions of courts. There are many questions, many, many questions. What happens to the urban form, master planning, the nature of representation and politics, and the idea of resistance, urban resistance. All these, all these are central to the modernist catalog of urbanism. Will they survive? Will they make sense? Should we just recall them? First, a short detour to the Western city. This is the thing, because I live in South Asia, I can't stick to South Asia. In the opening pages of his book, The Lost Dimension, Paul Virilio records the words of the mayor of Philadelphia, who in the late 1960s watched his city burn. And I quote, from here on in, claimed the nervous mayor, the frontiers of the state pass on to the interior of cities. As Virilio notes, the mayor was prescient for the burning of American cities presaged even greater troubles that lay in the horizon Lay, lay beyond and uh, before in the horizon. One can add Watts, Detroit, very close by, Newark, and later Brixton. The post-industrial metropolis among the fires of the 60s had arrived. Since then, in the advanced metropolitan centers, a significant story of urban crisis has been the narrative of infrastructural decline, imaging empty peripheral landscapes of former industrial areas, empty spaces, abandoned techno parks of rusted factories, all tomb signatures to a buried modernist era. Dead machines litter these spaces, which act as a hidden back end to the post-urban post sprawl. In the first issue of the architectural journal Grey Room, Antoine Picon suggested that these landscapes of rust exposed a certain anxiety which opened the possibilities of a grim future, and we are not very far from that. Picon's dark urban morphology overlaps with that of Paul Virilio, the end of classic, classic landscape as a consequence of media networks, the loss of autonomy of both technical objects and human species, all of which are now captured in science fiction, popular cyberpunk, and contemporary television shows. Others, like Anthony Widler, have, more, uh, have argued more convincingly that modern urbanism has always been haunted by enlightenment fears of dark space, which is seen as a repository of superstition, non-reason, and the breakdown of civility. Dark space constantly invades light space through the fear of epidemics, urban panic, the homeless multitude, and criminal activity. 
For the best part of the 20th century, modern urban planning and architecture has sought to stake out the idea of transparent space free from superstition, disease, myth, and non-rational behavior. Modernism's use of glass and light and the advocacy of the grid as a rational mapping of the city went, went along with the establishment of governmental authority. The norms and forms of modern urban governance would separate the civic from the criminal, the public from the private, the human from the non-human, putting in place a model that would promise the visible and healthy interaction of human beings. Now, this bipolar model of urban life, problematized by Widler, has been integral to modern urban management. It has come apart rapidly in ma many post-colonial cities. Urban life has imploded. The new expansion of cities has made classic urban management models irre irrelevant or simply inoperative. Proliferation, endless proliferation, marks the new post-colonial urban. Homeworks, uh, home workshops, markets, hawkers, small factories, small and large settlements of the working poor are now spread all over the planned metropolis or in regions where it was impossible to do some years ago. Productive, non-legal proliferation has emerged as the defining component of the new urban crisis in India and in other parts of the post-colonial world. The informality debates begun by the ILO economists had begun to ant anticipate, this in in the anticipate this way back in the 1970s. Informal work and settlement lacked governmental sanction, rapidly drawing the m new migrant poor, street traders, small workshops and neighborhood factories. What has emerged right from the outset is informali informality's ambivalence about the law, both in terms of housing settlements and production sites, which have worked through tenure rather than former title. Both in Sol Solomon Benjamin's work on East Delhi's industrial clusters and Timothy Mitchell's insight on informal housing in Egypt suggests that it is precisely this ambivalence about entering legal domains that has accounted for informality's strength. As Mitchell's work on Egypt shows, urban populations identified as informal tended to set away f uh, stay away from legal regimes of property, as the, as the latter potentially destroyed uh, local knowledges and brought the informals into extractive monetary structures of urban regimes. This is the history of most cities. In Delhi, uh, Solly Benjamin found out that the East Delhi neighborhood of Vishwasnagar, uh, near, where, near my house actually, was referred to as a slum by planners. In fact, emerged as the main center of electronics hardware production in North India in the 1980s, one of the biggest centers of electronics hardware production. People would come from all over North India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Nepal to buy there. Egyptian urbanist Asif Bayat called informality a quiet encroachment of the ordinary, in contrast to classic uh, political urban movements. Informality's political stance ranged from pragmatic to mercenary. Working variously with local politicians and state employees to get services, local land speculation, uh, they worked with speculators, local small crime syndicates who provided protection. Religious self-help groups, all the people whom Mike Davis hates. Illegal <laughs> lotteries called chit funds were often used to finance low-cost construction in all um, settlements that are called slums. You find this, right? So speculation, the speculator is always derided in, in, in modernist theory, but the speculator is a very complex category. So you have all kinds of characters, including working class people who are involved in this. Informality, I think, was probably less unstructured than the early debates made it out to be. It also developed complex internal inequalities of work and gender. What is important, I think, for me is that informality emerged from smaller academic and policy debates in the 1970s. It emerges from this debate to become a form of urban life that took center stage, absolute center stage, in the recent dramaturgy of urban crisis in India. And we've seen some of this in the morning. For state planners, neoliberal civic groups, orthodox Marxists, and the older secular elites, Informality became a model of wild, lawless urbanism and unplanned development that made a mockery of zoning. Lacking civic services, these zones emerged in civic reports as hellish sites of polluting industries, theft of civic services, political vote banks. Informality was urbanism out of joint. It was the hellish outside of the law of the city. A selective phenomenology of urban informality as proliferating life, I think, clearly marks Mike Davis, who's horrified by it, and Kulas' text, you know. In, for Davis, informality marks a morbid negation of any urban vision of collectivist sol solidarity. While for Kulas, informality is life itself. 
with an organic rhythm emerging from the bowels of the post-colonial city. It is increasingly clear that this unhinged proliferation of urban life is enclosed in a world of media urbanism. Post-colonial cities today are media cities, a tag typically reserved for the global city. In the works of Saskia Sassen and Manuel Castells, international technological networks of finance and communication produce new geographies of concentration and dispersal. Sassen argues that financial centers concentrate in certain core, and core cities, and we know that it's a familiar argument, with large, increasingly disfranchised, low-end low, low workforce who provide services and backup. New York, Shanghai, etc., etc., right? Now, I would say, and it's not just me, that media today is the flesh. It's the flesh of urban life. It's not a discrete institution outside it. Planners, civic campaigners, activists, most urban citizens know this. I suspect urban scholars in India will get to this in a decade or so. An increasing body of research from Mexico to Nigeria and now Asia has shown that post-colonial cities are vibrant hubs for media productions, spurred on by a range of low-cost infrastructures, mobile telephony, video, and digital technologies, and parallel distribution circuits. This produces a media experience that assumes constant breakdown, recycled assemblages, serial dispersal, and endless proliferation of multiple forms and sites. So breakdown and productive life are actually enmeshed in a very, very dynamic constellation, very dynamic constellation. This experience of the media city produces a very complex hyperstimulus endless hyperstimulus, an escalation of the senses along with increasing speeds of the city, a relentless circulation of things, images, and people. This is an unstable combination of breakdown and speed that, that refracted, I think, for most of the decade of the 90s to spaces, public discourses. It's a productive but a dark environment. Proliferation in this context this proliferation, this media proliferation, produced a diversity of media experiences. But what it did, very interestingly, is it abolished classic boundaries of consumption and circulation, drawing urban populations into a dynamic but addictive loop, deeply addictive. This has changed both the plane of media and the expression of urban life. It's something I've argued in my recent book. Media is not media anymore. The city is not the city anymore. We have a problem. In, in India, the post-independence project of setting the media as a discrete institution apart from the city has long vanished. The new technologies of urban government now have, since the 1990s, acknowledged governmentally this enmeshing of media and urban life. The management of urban affect to new techniques are central, absolutely central, to the new discourse of power. Urban populations are equal, equally complicit, equally complicit in a shifting media anthropology of the senses, in every sense, every sense, going beyond the classic predictions of uh, earlier critical media theory. In this sense, in this sense, the classic dualism of plan and counterplan, public spaces versus privatization, order versus productive chaos, cannot capture the growing entanglements of media, media politics and urban life, which inaugurates a new kinesthetic of movement, creation, and death. The classic language of the modernist city, planning, the social, and reform, and its Western avant-garde critic appear increasingly like political technologies of a fast-receding era. But re returning to Kulas, I think he gets one thing right. One thing he gets right. He's a smart guy. The idea that the urban crisis has exposed new and old assemblages. Suddenly, this crisis, which is not a moment, it's a long drawn-out decade, it opens up things. If you remember, Benjamin says, the actuality of the everyday is when the present becomes visible. This is something equivalent to what happened in the 90s. Suddenly, certain things shifted and certain people became powerless. The urban crisis emerges as the borderless zone of a permanent overflow. It's living in this eternal present, assaulted by all kinds of things. I want to look shortly at Delhi, very briefly, to capture this, because I'm really capturing a series of surfaces. I'm moving through that, right? What about Delhi? The Delhi Master Plan of 1962, and the design 
by U.S. planner Albert Mayer and his colleagues, saw the city as a productive organism. Easy movement was integral to this imaginary. This involved a careful distinction between forms of labor and subjectivity that were seen as appropriate to urban life. Those who did not fit this model could be open for displacement in the event of a failed assimilation to urbanism. And I've talked about this greater in detail in, one, in my first chapter. The first master plan had presumed a small city with a reasonable balance between public and private transport. For the most part, since the internal emergency of the 1970s, this model was seen to hold together, albeit with strains. With, mod with industrialization in the, early, in the initial years after the master plan, Delhi was seen almost moving towards the model of a productive city. The master plan's model had presumed a largely administrative capital that began to rapidly come, about, come, come apart by the late 1970s. By the time of the Asian Games in 1982, one of the most important events uh, in the 80s, the population of the capital had swelled with new migrants. It's estimated three to four million people uh, entered the city then. And when we, when we did a survey of working class people in these three neighborhoods we work in, and we asked them, what is the thing you remember about the 80s? Not the pogroms against the Sikh mi minority, no the games. Working people remember the games. They came and worked there. right? So, because it was in the city, it was not outside the city. By the 1990s, so basically you have the emergency, you have this, after the emergency, the suspension of uh, political controls, the, the controls on the poor are lifted, uh, this huge expansion. So the city rapidly expands, outside the law, but it expands massively. Now, by the 1990s, a feeling of crisis and constant breakdown in the city exposed the inadequacies of the master plan. As if to suggest the failure of the master plan imaginary of order development, the bulk of Delhi's residents now live in non-legal neighborhoods, ranging from working class settlements to elite usurpa usurpations of public space. After the 1990s, crisis points of the city have been mapped onto different landscapes. The liberal environmentalist demand to remove polluting industries from the city, chaotic public transportation, the alarming high rates of death on the road, and the paranoic security discourses after the wars in Kashmir and Punjab. All these overflowed in Delhi. And the national security thing is very serious in all Indian cities, particularly after Bombay. It's absolutely fundamental. It fleshes in with this whole media management. Right? In the event, this is the 1990s, urban crisis priced open the existing political arrangements of the city. This political arrangement had involved, involved a grafting of political claims by local populations with routine practices of urbanism, a phenomenon that the writer Partha Chatterjee has aptly called political society. This had accommodated the great expansion of the non-legal city in the 1980s, often with the help of local politicians. Since the 1990s, and this is a very important shift, since the 1990s, this older political model of urban growth has been thrown into complete confusion. A significant cause of this has been a middle-class environmental civic campaign that petitioned sympathetic courts, portraying the city as a space on the brink of ecological collapse and transport disaster. I mean, it's very difficult for me to... The 90s were something else in Delhi. Something else. City on the brink. So what you have is... Perceived in civic campaign, then the court comes in, middle class court. Perceived in civic campaigns is the only space uh, protected from the corruption of political elites. Court intervention in the city was fundamental, absolutely fundamental, woven in with media landscapes and narratives of urban catastrophe. So catastrophe is central to this. It's really moving through a, to a dramaturgy. The courts had been shifting steadily towards liberal interventionism in the 1990s, a discourse ironically produced by social movement technologies of appeal to legal justice. So movements come in, have the PIL, Olga Telles case that Jane has mentioned, is a very important shift. It's a very problematic judgment, if you read the text of the judgment. Uh, but but it, it, it was seen as opening up the public interest litigation, that anyone could go to court and petition the court. But by the, by the 1990s, you really have middle-class civic campaigners who are petitioning the court. It's a kind of technology of appeal. It, it's a new technology of justice. The 1962 master plan, very interestingly, acts as an imaginary reference in this constellation. In 2006, so the court, in 2006, very important judgment, and there were three general strikes in the city after that. 
In 2006, the Supreme Court pronounced that all construction, all construction, settlement and life that were in violation of the 1962 master plan were non-conforming and had to be demolished by the city. Can you imagine? 1962, there's a master plan that's notified and the whole city has changed, right? And, and new notifications have happened. 1990, you know, 1981, the, the, the new, new, it's really not a new, new master plan. Whole city has expanded. And so the argument is, you were non-conforming. Non so they had to be demolished. Now the city didn't want to do it, the politicians didn't want to do it, the cops didn't want to do it, all kind. But what it did, the order did, it touched every neighborhood of squatter camps and thousands, thousands of small shops that was as well as simple extensions and modifications of homes, simple extensions. So this is this moment. The court order, and it's coming in a series of a lot of court orders. This is discourse, this is, dramaturgy has been continuing for eight years now with, with the removal of industries. And the courts are seen as absolute God now. The court order act, acted as a master reference in this crisis with daily violence when demolition squads moved in. Public anxiety was reflected in screaming headlines and non-stop news coverage. And remember, the court, more than anyone else, knows that media is the flesh of the city. It is enacted, the legal judgment as urban theory is enacted. It says in a court judgment, you have to cover this in all channels. Very interesting judgment, right? Anyway, so public anxiety is reflected in screaming headlines, non-stop news coverage, right? And so this brings to a climax the political crisis, a mode throughout the 1990s, when court orders declared various forms of life to be outside, out, out of conformity with the law. It's happening one after another. Polluting small industries, out. Speeding public buses. And the settlement, and, and all settlement in land that was defined as public. The court orders mobilized images of urban chaos, executive style command, and a cinematic urgency of movement in its judgment. Practices, practices that were ordinarily part of the pastoral power of government were suddenly rendered visible through dramatic civic judgments. In these judgments, the courts accelerated images of crisis. They accelerate this image of crisis already in circulation in the hyperstimulus of the city. Judgments typically mobilized private expert knowledge and addressed campaigns by groups who combined research with media. So this, they, 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 they're mobilizing all kinds of new knowledges. It is not simply an old bourgeois city coming. It's something else going on. So new knowledges, new forms of judgment about what the city is are coming in which the court is mobilizing. We don't know anything about air. Air is a technical thing. So let's call the expert. The old expert would, um, would, would, would go to the city, go to the MCD, Municipal Corporation. Now the, the expert comes to the court, the special committee, which is set up. The special committees go around sealing places. Right? It's a completely new m setting up of authority, right? Enacted publicly. It, it, it's, it's done through this event. So they're mobilizing private expert knowledge and address campaigns by groups who combine research with media advocacy. Whole new series of groups. Center for Science and Environment, uh, Clean Air Campaign, lots of civic groups, all middle class groups who hold politicians in utter contempt. Right? So what you have is the phantom civic subject here was a responsible private middle class cit citizen who is the injured legatee of the urban body, in whose name they speak. Like Kulhas's almost revelatory description of Lagos, and Kulhas is going on a helicopter, for those of you who remember the essay, the court orders continuously, continuously dramatized a vast surface of a previously hidden city, at least to the, them. These include, included new unauthorized neighborhoods, informal and non-legal settlements, working class migrations, and a vast network of small markets, neighborhood factories, and small shops. Horizontal networks of production, circulation, new work patterns, a dizzying complex of infrastructure support, tenure, and occupation emerged, a dynamic mix which, which became the ingredient for the crisis narrative mobilized in the court cases in the 1990s. Vast traffic, new smells of plastic garbage, industrial waste, food shops, burnt fume from buses and auto rickshaws, all transformed and inflamed the sadness produced by this hyperstimuli of urbanism. So this is, this is, what I'm trying to say here is, there is a city. Planners designate something as urban. 
in in the old documents i'm i'm not saying what it is and this moment is constantly uh, you know the, in, in in benjamin has this thing about the camera he says the camera is like the surgeon scalpel it exposes during a moment of danger and this is what this court ju- court judgment is really an eye it is not n- normally an eye but it becomes an eye in the 90s it's every day this eye is moving in the city okay this is this, this is an illegal settlement out buses speeding buses speed co- speed controls electronic governors they have to wear uniforms they have to stop 10 minutes the judgments are really detailed 10 minutes in each stop 5 meters from and all and, and the experts who are counseling them this is the most rational way of stopping so it's a, it's a completely new urban assemblage which comes to being in the 990s and the politicians are completely powerless at this time right now <coughs> i remember this uh, uh, incident in which my partner was making a film uh, working with uh, this family in chajanabad this man very interesting man who was uh, displaced uh, and uh, in, in a firing in 76 during the emergency and he came back and uh, when the court actually displaced him and he he was asked you know why are you going and he, you know they didn't say government he didn't say government he says courts it's a courts order so it's an abstract <laughs> institution of power which he did not have the language for designating but later it moved you know so this is the this is the moment of the 90s so what is happening is the crowding of media surfaces which is really what the city has become created an information zone of active disorientation in the early years blending and sharpening the developing urban crisis so things are accelerated it's not just the court the all other, all other forms of life that are accelerating with its ever expanding sensory and mobile worlds media culture intensified the confusion between technology and the body as millions came into contact with machine culture this is a sense there was a sense of the city as a delirious out of control landscape of effects a well known hindi short story writer captures this well and he says and i remember that story then he said governments were formed and fell everyone's memory was like a video cassette on which new images and voices were recorded every day and erased every night each morning everyone woke up with new no recollection whatsoever of anything that had happened the previous day unquote this bipolar vision of the city as a hellish present of techniques and erasure i think reflects the feelings of the old left literary generation aghast they were aghast at the speed and turmoil of the 1990s in this narrative the 1990s emerges as a post colonial fall it is the end where is all this fit with the larger question the older modernist archive 20th century movements of urban circulation combined the movements of modern capitalist commodities with money and media when this dynamic arrangement of money and media exceeds established orders of management and individual ap- adaptation during crisis i think the effects are visceral and devastating in elias canetti's book crowds and power brilliant book the massification of urban life through commodification and rationalization become a productive force the loss of individual autonomy is paralleled by the growth of power when a person joins the crowd this dialectic this is fantastic section in canetti is rendered turbulent during the crisis of runaway inflation he's looking really at two two both crowds and power in auto da fe 1920s germany right inflation german inflation so this dialectic completely changes you're anonymous in a crowd but the crowd money and people the whole dialectic is reversed and then he says kanetti writes and kanetti is a young jewish person exile living in frankfurt he says an inflation cancels out distinctions between men that seemed eternal and brings together in that same inflation people who would have scarcely nodded to each other in the street in canetti's prescient phenomenology the dialectic of the crowd and power is suddenly and dramatically reversed in crisis expanding numerically and across classes while losing power as materially uh, money materially devalues so money which demeans you as an individual when it collapses in value 
transforms the relationship of the capitalist city and assembles people because it has no value, right? In inflation, equalizes. Uh, only that which is outside of circulation, like treasure or family gold, become valuable as it is rare. Like in Canetti's narrative, to shift, like in Canetti's narrative, the Indian Supreme Court's judgments on the city produced a parallel technique of agglomeration and exposure, right? Well, Kennedy says you're naked in a crowd when you have no money, but you're equal. So it's, it, it's, it's a way, it's a parallel technique of agglomeration. Suddenly all these parts of the city that were seen as different, no one saw them, is brought together in this judgment, thing called judgment. And exposure, you're, it's a kind of expose model. Everyone and every space that had gone outside the law of the city set up in the plan now became a culprit, like the crowd in inflation. Everyone's equal. And everyone is suddenly put together and drawn together, right? For a few months, the few became the many, a vast uh, army of culprits before the court. If in Canetti, the abstract movement of falling money value is the motor behind the expanding crowd during inflation, the court judgment uses formal, the formal abstraction of law to constitute the many. In marking the centrality of the crowd to power, Canetti draws on and comments on the vast archive of European modernism. Here the crowd regulates the relationship between the individual and the mass, the public and the bystander, revolution and counter-revolution, the techniques of the observer, the flaneur and the detective, the vast corpus of modern architectural movements from Corbusier to Mies, modern management and surveillance in general. This centrality of the crowd has declined in contemporary urban discourse as well as urban planning. We can even argue that for a visitor from non-Western cities of the 20th century, there is no easy road, no easy road back to the pre-war urban archive of, this, of the crowd with its specific uh, European drama of modernism and someone like Canetti, the avant-garde critic. So what happened? I think the plan gave way to something that still does not have a name. In Lagos and Delhi, same thing, in a sense. For practical reasons, I have called it elsewhere, I've called it the bypass. The bypass emerged as a pragmatic appropriation of the city, more marginal than media res. For many, the bypass was the city as much as such a thing can have a body or a persona. Now, this bypass does not fit classical representational political technologies, the resistant, the tactical, the marginal, the multitude, or the movement. I wish it did, but it doesn't. The bypass took its power from productive proliferation that acted as a viral force that spread everywhere, producing a crisis in urban management, legal theory, and neighborhood politics. So proliferation actually induces virally a series of crises in all kinds of ways of thinking. As a form of life indifferent to the law of the plan, as a form of life indifferent to the law of the plan, the bypass became for the elites an allegory for the decline of the city. It is this time without a name, this time without a name, that the current elites in power in, in India, clearly, are trying to reverse and reassemble by initiating new technologies of information and management. Now, where that goes, we don't know. But they, including Kapil Sibal, who's initiated this, now know that media is the flesh of the city. So informationalization is going to transform the older model of welfare. So Chatterjee will have to write another essay, clearly. Now, let, return, to return to the larger question, and this is not an easy, easy set of questions, how does one do urban research today in the context of fading modernist experiments of the 20th century in the post-colonial world? I have two modest suggestions and then I'll close. First, I think urban research must move beyond the obsessive national focus obsessive national focus and move towards a comparative urbanism that engages with other post-colonial societies. And I think the obsessive national focus is greatest. It's really stressful among scholars of India and China. 
it's it's very bad worst i think in the older social sciences trust me it's very bad among the older social sciences but happily less so in new disciplines like media and cultural studies much better they they completely at par with all international debates and they intervene in that urban practice for example if you to make a case for this in india has always been regional and international always a city like delhi has drawn from turkic rajput timurid persian designs colonial post colonial urbanism they know this Now Bombay and Bangalore have international consultant and designers. Research can match this. I'll be a bit differently. It depends on what you're doing. The second suggestion, I think, is a trickier one, and this is easier said than done, is to signal a new engagement with urban practice. At least if you're working on the contemporary period, not everyone has to do this, but at least if you're working on the contemporary period. In my own case, my own case, I have learned the most not from professional Indian academics about cities. but interesting practitioners writers designers journalists comic book designers touts speculators artists and a whole new generation of creative working class people in india cities very interesting creative working class people and this i think is the most at least for city research the most difficult uh, question it is not going to be easy because well, this is a problem for the university system is a problem it's a problem because i think there's the excessive professionalism of the us university in in its cu- current business industrial form i don't have to make an argument for this we are living it the s- excessive hierarchy of the european university i think allows very little space for this for example the most interesting uh, visitors whom i have engaged with are people who come from outside the university in both the europe and, and the us they go everywhere and they engage with you know artists practitioners uh architects who are not professional architects small time architects writers because they ask all kinds of interesting questions so this is this is difficult but it's it's not impossible it's not impossible there are a lot of interesting people who've done it and, and who are doing it a lot of young scholars are doing it which is which is a good thing and i think there are very interesting traditions of uh, urban research interesting traditions of urban research which exist before this industrial system came into place in 1920s europe in japan incredible work in japan 1960s in France, 1950s, 1960s in France, and then 68 sort of killed in Lefebvre is the last of that generation. 1940s in Bombay, very interesting movements in Bombay. 1960s in Calcutta, early 1960s Calcutta, fascinating. I think what what it means really is looking for and reassembling a different urban archive. It's an elusive and critical task, I think, but there's no greater task with greater urgency today. Thank you. Thank you.